Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lewis, as it said on the slide for the last five minutes. Um, yeah, so um, I'm also from Cookpad. Um, we organize a meetup every month called Southwest Ruby. So that's going quite well. We had a like, meetup last night, which was nice. And um, tomorrow we're going to be in Manchester, so sort of like three Ruby meetups. So it's really nice to see like, so many Rubyists in the UK. I get to travel around this week and see everyone outside of the normal kind of conference schedule stuff. So uh, yeah, and uh, at Cookpad, I, I sort of work on a team um, responsible for um, the feed, like the news feed, which is like on the homepage of the apps and on the website. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Tonight, specifically, I was going to share um, about how we've been using Kafka um, at Cookpad and why we've chosen to use it. So Cookpad's just like a monolithic Rails application mostly, and uh, we use Ruby for a lot of different things. Um, we've got various other sort of smaller applications apart from the monolith, so I guess maybe we're moving a little bit more towards like a services-oriented architecture. And uh, tonight, yeah, we'll see sort of why we chose to use it, the benefits, the pros and cons. We've had like a few little problems getting started, and then maybe, you know, we can talk about like some questions afterwards, the same as with Carl. And uh, yeah. So what is Kafka? Anyone familiar with Kafka? What it is? Great, this talk's not for you. <laughs> I stole that one from Carl. Um, yeah, so the official definition is Apache Kafka is a distributed streaming platform capable of handling trillions of events a day. So that's like, trillions is a really big number. Uh, not surprising, it was sort of like the brainchild of LinkedIn um, and the team there, and they sort of open sourced it back in 2011 to Apache. Um, we get the scalability from a few really interesting architectural choices, and uh, we, uh, we can have a little look at them tonight. And uh, maybe you've used or heard of RabbitMQ, sort of messaging bus. Um, so yeah, some similarities, and there's also some differences that make Kafka really interesting. One of the analogies I really like is Slack. Uh, anyone use Slack? Yeah, anyone in a Slack channel? Yeah, very good. So I'm also in a Slack channel. And um, this is just like one for our meetup yesterday. So like a really cool way to think about Slack, if you, if you first join, not really direct messages, if we just talk about channels in Slack, if you join a Slack channel, you're like the only person in that Slack channel. It's a lonely place to be. But you can talk to yourself, I guess, if you wanted to. So you can send a message to the Slack channel, and then like you can receive a message back from the Slack channel, and that's just only you can like kind of see it. Um, then you can invite somebody else into the Slack channel, and you've kind of got like a two-way conversation going on, three people in the Slack channel, and um, then you can all send and receive messages to each other on a give, given topic. You can then, maybe two of you could go and set up another Slack channel, and then you're in two Slack channels in the same Slack organization. And then like maybe six months down the line, you know, you've got a new colleague that joins your team, and you can add them into one of those Slack channels, and they, they get to see all the new messages that have been sent that are sent and received on that channel but also they could scroll back up like scroll up the list and go back in time and see all the previous messages on that channel if they wanted to so is it with kafka um channels are called topics so that's a kafka topic and people are called producers and consumers depending on whether you're sending or receiving a message, and you could be both, so you could be a producer and a consumer of a given application. So that's the analogy I, I really like for Kafka. But like, why is that interesting to us as like Ruby developers, Rails applications maybe, or in any sort of typical architecture? Well, a few months ago, I was um, sort of tasked with uh, changing one of our key features, this newsfeed. Um, within Cookpad, and it's like one of our busiest times of year is, uh, is Ramadan. And that's um, a really interesting time because like in Indonesia, for instance, one of our largest markets, Muslim population, during that, that festival over the course of the month, um, it's a very important time, family time in the evening, people cook together and, uh, and eat together. And so for us, our traffic just goes sky high for that month. Everyone's sort of sharing recipes, um, looking for interesting things to, to eat, and like a real celebration for the whole month. So we want to really, like, as, as Cookpad, we want to make, make the best experience we can for people around cooking. 
And uh, so we were tasked to make some changes to our newsfeed for that event. Um, this is our feed. And um, this is what it looks like on the iOS app. Um, I can follow people and like, see stuff from, that they've posted. Um, we wanted, though, to improve this because at the moment this is sort of like a time-ordered list of things that you, your friends or people you're connected with cook. Cheesecake's good. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we wanted to make it, you know, instead of it being chronological, we wanted to like really, if you hadn't visited for a week or two weeks, we wanted to make it so you don't miss any of the important content that you've maybe that's come up during that two weeks you've been away from Cookpad and you come back. Fairly typical feature, but trying to think about how we're going to build that feature was quite a challenge. So we've got our feed is made up of these activity cards. We've got like a recipe published, or you can actually you can cook a recipe on Cookpad and um, share it, and that's what this uh, kind of cook snap feature is. Or in this case, Carl has liked a recipe, and uh, we show those in the feed too. So. I looked at the current architecture in the application, um, I began to dive into it and I wanted to come up with like an estimate for how long it was going to take us to make these changes to see if we could make them in the four weeks that we had before Ramada. Um, and I fired up my sort of text editor and I found something like this. Actually, I found this exact code. <laughs> um, this is like our recipe model in a Rails application. Right at the top there is our callbacks where we um, generate feed items, which are just like another database table. And um, that happens like on different events. So the thing is, though, as you just saw in the previous slide about the different activities, you know, it's not just on the recipe model. These were like on several different models throughout the application, mm -hmm. similar callbacks on each. And you know, it became a real challenge to think, like, how are we going to be able to actually decouple this and make this, um, make this feed really easy to reason about from an application architecture point of view? Um, even running migrations on the feed table was difficult. So we got a single feed table, it's like 500 million rows. So like running a database migration on that is like a really non-trivial exercise. So went back to the product team and was like, sorry, we can't do this. You know, we're going to have to make some little cosmetic changes for Ramadan. We're going to have to just do um, some tweaks, basically. We're not going to be able to do relevant feed in time. Um, and I really then started, the next step of the process was to go back to the rest of the, the team and say like, what's our architecture looking like? What's our plans? And uh, yeah, we started to talk about architecture a lot. Um, so yeah, different approaches possible. Obviously we had the current callbacks approach. We wanted to think about different data stores as well. We know that like in the early days, Instagram had a lot of success with Redis. That's, that's something I've been looking at a lot. And we wanted to look at this concept of like a services-oriented architecture a little bit more. Some people suggested, you know, maybe splitting that out. Can we, instead of having it callbacks all over our Rails code base, is this really like a separate thing that could live on a, in a service on its own? And uh, we, we thought, we, you know, it's worth exploring that a little bit further. So, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we've got our monolith. Um, Ruby on Rails, about 60,000 lines of code. Not, not the biggest Ruby, Ruby on Rails application, but definitely not a small one either. And you know, our architecture, we have another search application. So that's sort of the two main applications. The search application is a lot smaller, and really it's just a proxy to Elasticsearch. So I was aware of that. Um, we, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, <coughs> quote from DHH, there are patterns that are less about the code and more about how the code is being written by whom and within which organization. And so that was really the case with our um, web and search sort of, uh, Rails applications. We have a web <coughs> team, that's me and Carl, <laughs> and the rest of the guys, and the search team. So the search team very much more focused on Elasticsearch and that sort of skill set, uh, but also Ruby developers. But yeah, we just, however it evolved, we've got a web team and a search team. Um, so we began to sort of think about how we could slot the feeds into this. And we, we didn't want to do the same thing as the search uh, service. We were already running like APIs between the two. You've got to keep the APIs up to date in step. Um, actually, there's a shared database between the two as well, which is a really like gnarly piece of the architecture. And we didn't want to run into those same pitfalls again. So we looked at how we could think about the feed as events that happen in the application, like a user <laughs> likes a recipe or a... Um, someone comments on a recipe or someone cook snaps a recipe, emit those to Kafka, and then like, if we think of that as our Slack channel, 
the web application says to the Slack channel, you know, uh, user likes recipe. The feeds application is a member of that channel too, can consume from that channel and uh, sees, oh, you know, user likes recipe. Well, we log that then in uh, Redis and that's our sort of rudimentary feed, um, so to speak. So once we've kind of figured out this is what we wanted to try, um, we had to break it down. Actually, I said liked recipe there. There's a ton of different messages that we need to send. In our, con in our context, we have some moderation, so things can be approved or unapproved, bookmarked or unbookmarked, deleted, and so on. So we came up with this kind of list of events. And obviously, defining your events is quite interesting because unlike humans, you know, you can write anything you like in a Slack channel and anyone else can probably understand it if it's in the same language. Um, with computers, obviously, if, if there's a slight typo in that, slap, in that message, the other rece recipient is not going to understand it. So this is the challenge when you think about like an event-driven architecture is um, what format are your messages going to be in? And uh, is the recipient going to understand now and are they going to understand in the future? So that's, that, that's what we call schema and uh, message schema. And so we have to start thinking about a message schema up front. So these are sort of the, the way we divided our, our, data, um, our events into topics, um, like recipes topic, a user's topic, and a recipes, recipe visits topic. Recipe visits an interesting one. Um, that's our super high volume like topic. So those events happen at a way higher volume than all the others. Because all you've got to do to, make, to trigger that event is actually just visit um, a recipe on Cookpad, and that, then that, that triggers a Kafka event straight away. Um, the others are lower volume, and we've split them out like that because uh, we wanted to keep, not only keep them separate, but some consumers might not be interested in what happens with users. You know, they just want to know about what's happening with the recipes, and, uh, and so that's kind of what we decided to do. There are some other considerations as well, like um, message ordering. So, uh, Message ordering is only guaranteed within a partition of a topic. And so um, if you need, like in Slack, obviously you can see by time when the messages were received, but it is possible with Kafka if to receive messages slightly out of order. And um, that's something to consider as well when you're designing your message structure, but it's kind of a bit more of an advanced topic. Um, we, in terms of what the messages look like, you know, it's not plain English. We're, we're just going to use JSON at this point. There are other options available with Kafka. You know, you can send raw bytes. You can send the images. The popular one is Avro, um, which is kind of enforces the schema with a, a product called Schema Registry. But to start with, we just wanted to keep it really simple and just stick with JSON because that's easy to understand from both the producer and the consumer side, and it's easy for us to uh, to kind of keep track of it. And that's sort of what it looks like. So yeah, um, as, I, as I said, you know, this is what we settled with, and those messages are flowing there between the web API, Kafka, and being consumed by the feeds application. So went and spoke to the infrastructure team at Cookpad, and was like, hey, we guys, we, know we want to use Kafka. And they were like, oh, great, another service to support and maintain. maintain. So that was a good conversation. But no, they were, they were super helpful, and it was all fine, because they just said, oh, don't worry, we'll just use the cloud, and it, um, it's going to be good. So Confluent um, are a, a cloud hosting provider. They can set up Kafka in your AWS region or your Google App Engine region. So there's like really minimal latency between your app. For us, we just set it up in US East One, AWS. And um, they have sort of different tiers. So we like went in on the professional tier and then we just don't have to worry about any of the infrastructure. So that's been cool. Uh, right, so we've got Kafka, we've got our messages, we understand what we're trying to build. Um, let's get started. Um, first of all, then we need to produce the messages. And uh, there's some really cool Ruby libraries around this that help us. Zendesk, um, big users of Kafka, big contributors to the open source community. They have several um, sort of gems uh, available. Ruby Kafka is like the low level one. Um, and just reading the readme on that project is a great way to go from like knowing nothing about Kafka to knowing all the main topics. So just the readme of that gem is, is really interesting. So we use that. And actually, the only part we found was like a little bit lacking was like the, the glue into our Rails code. And we wanted to do some cookpad specific things. So we've made a gem. It's called Streamy. Um, it's open source on our GitHub. And um, it just supports a few little things like uh, 
a basic kind of base event class for producing to Kafka. And uh, we, we also implemented uh, the concept of message priorities, which was something that was important to us. So if it's a really high, high priority or essential message, it's sent straight away to Kafka. If it's kind of less important, we're, we're happy to batch them up into groups of a thousand or whatever, and then just send them periodically. Um, that, that improves performance, sending them in a batch, but there's always the danger we could lose them. So, you know, if I follow another user, that's quite, to us, that's quite an important event. If I just like a recipe, you know, maybe that's less important. Like if we lose a like, mm, it's not going to have, you know, we're not a bank. It's not going to cause a, cause a big deal. <laughs> so, yeah. Say that now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where's, my where's my like? <laughs> my likes have, have not been the correct number. <laughs> So, no, but that is important actually. Like, it is important to choose the right tool for the job. And when you are like, I think Facebook have got the slogan, like, move fast and break things. You know, that's great for them. <laughs> um, for us, you know, it's similar. We can, we can take, take risks sometimes, which is nice. Um, but working for other places or in other contexts, or maybe we do actually do some payment stuff. We've got a premium service that probably won't be going on to Kafka anytime soon. You know, so that's, that's just for us. So yeah, in terms of like what it looks like in, in, in Ruby and Rails, we actually um, put it into our app folder. So you know, we've got our controllers, models, views. We've got events in there now, and we've got every like event type as a, as a class. Kind of a, a plain old Ruby object, um, but that just inherits from our application event um, class, which inherits from Streamy, which is our framework that we've, we've created. We specify the topic name. We set it up with whatever um, model or whatever we need to send an event for and, and the actual event can generate the JSON payload and does it in a really consistent way which is important. On the so that's the producing side. Um, it, on the consuming side to receive messages, um, we really have committed on to using a, a gem called Karafka. Um, somebody mentioned to me earlier about Racecar from Zendesk which is another option. But we found like Karafka has been really cool. The, the author of Karafka has been over to the Southwest Ruby meetup. He's like a really great guy and he's worked with us to fix like problems in it. So um, he's also spoken at Ruby Kaigi. His name's Mache. And um, yeah, I'd highly recommend checking out Karafka if you're interested in consuming Kafka events. He's also got a gem called Waterdrop for producing Kafka events, um, which is interesting. Um, so yeah, it, makes, it takes away a lot of the low-level stuff, like performance. Um, it makes it sort of like when you make a controller, a, a consumer, sorry, it feels a lot like a Rails controller, except in HTTP requests. But you're not. You're, you're, you've got a Kafka consumer, and instead of HTTP params, you've got your message params that come in. So that's like really nice. It feels like really familiar uh, as a Rails um, developer. Again, really great documentation, wiki, readme. I'd highly recommend checking it out. It handles this concept of um, consumer groups. Um, this is like our users topic. We've got two consumers in a consumer group. This is a neat feature for um, performance, but also for um, if one of our feeds consumers goes down or an instance of our feeds consumer, it's fine, the other one's there to pick up um, and vice versa. So you can do like rolling restarts and stuff. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, in terms of like what this architecture bega began to enable that you know, we couldn't do before. Like these, are, these are new concepts for us. With reads and writes separated um, with Kafka, we were able to, to start thinking about how we wanted to create like a beta environment. And we had like our, our global web application producing events to Kafka. That's the blue, that's our production stack, global feeds reading from our production Kafka. But we began to think, well, actually, if all the production events are being written into Kafka, what if we set up another kind of set of instances with their own databases to read from that production Kafka? Well, then we have like an identical copy of the database, both MySQL and Redis. And that, that's a great test environment because we've got all production data in there, but if we modify it, we're not modifying the production databases. So we're actually able to create this really functional um, test environment for our feeds. And that's really, important for feeds specifically because if I want to demo a feed, if I want to demo your feed to you, but you see like fake data or you see somebody else's data, you can't judge like how good is this feed actually going to be for me. So this test environment is going to be key to like developing the product forward with Cutpad because we can actually do some user testing, we can do research, 
um, even just testing it with product managers so they can get a feel for like whatever new algorithm or ranking uh, formula that we put in place. So this has been really useful. Another use case that popped up for us was this idea of um, recipe activity or connection events, we call them internally. And this is sort of a bit like on LinkedIn. You know when you can see on LinkedIn who's like viewed your profile and stuff is a bit weird sometimes. Um, but it's similar to that, but you can actually see like who's been checking out your recipes. And it, the, you can opt out of this, but it's, the goal is to connect users on Cutpad. And actually, it turns out this is like another type of feed. And it turns out that this can use Kafka events too. All the exact same events that we've been storing for the past few months. When we launched this feature, rather than starting the feature with an empty blank slate, we were able to go back in time and consume all the Kafka events that were stored within Kafka and actually rebuild this feed for everyone. And like previously, th those events would have been lost. We would have just had the final state in the database. So it's really like interesting and um, uh, useful feature of Kafka, this ability to store messages back in time, like on Slack channels that you can like scroll up. One of the problems we had as uh, any company in Europe is GDPR. Like Kafka's, they've got this storage capability, right? Well, how do you, you can't randomly delete stuff from it. So how do you handle uh, GDPR? Well, there is a solution. It's a bit complicated, but it's nice to know it exists. And it's this uh, concept of log compaction. So the events come in in order. And for instance, they all have the same key. In this case, it's like user one. And Kafka can actually run a, like a cleanup task every now and then if configured to do so, where it will go through and just keep the most recent event. So if you have that all configured um, and your final event is like user closed account in this case with the user of one, all these original events, these will all have been cleaned up from Kafka and all you'll be left with is um, user closed account. So it was nice to know that we had that ability and that solution. One of the things that's been really important to us is high quality monitoring and logging. Um, because it's not like a Rails application where users will phone you up or tweet when the whole site goes down. Um, you need to keep track of like, is this thing working properly? And so we had to set up like Prometheus and Grafana to, to help us do that. Using Karafka, that's got a really great section on its wiki where you can learn more about the different configuration options. And one of the things actually was also great was New Relic. So New Relic, have, um, we've, I'm gonna share some code with uh, the author of Karafka for um, better New Relic integrations. I don't know if you use New Relic, but that'll show you, you know, if you've got a slow database query in your message consuming, you can pick that up and make sure you don't fall behind, you know, in, in, your, in your message processing. And uh, yeah, so that's it really. I'm ha happy to take any of your questions and it's me on Twitter. So thank you very much for having me.